Hi, Dr. Lyons here, of course. In this class, we've been discussing the mechanical behavior of materials and uh, the particular section of the chapter that we're on deals with tensile deformation and properties. And last time we discussed elastic properties and plastic deformation. In this video, I'll talk about fracture and design considerations and also the next section of this chapter uh, dealing with hardness. So if you will look back at uh, the notes from last time, we were talking about the tensile behavior of material. So on the left is a schematic of a tensile specimen with a gauge length L, cross-sectional length, uh, cross-sectional area A. And when the sample is stretched at a constant strain rate, in other words, the strain is changing uh, linearly over time, then the force is the response, and we get a stress-strain curve which increases initially linearly and then uh, continues to rise as the material strain hardens. At some point, necking begins, and the cross-sectional area of the sample decreases rapidly in the neck, and as a result, the force uh, required to stretch the sample or the engineering stress will drop. This is what you would get for uh, a ductile material like aluminum. It's not drawn to scale. It's shown schematically to illustrate the different aspects of elastic region, the plastic deformation region, and the third point, which is fracture. And so that's what we want to talk about is what leads to fracture and what is the final step in the uh, life of the sample. So Roman numeral three is fracture. And I'm going to declare that there are three steps that result or lead to fracture. The first is damage accumulation. Damage accumulation. It's the first step. Second step is crack formation. Crack formation. And the third step is crack propagation. Damage accumulation, crack formation, and crack propagation. The Behavior of materials uh, it depends on their, on their crystal structure and, and a number of other aspects of their microstructure. If we were to look at a couple of samples here of metal, uh, this one on the top is cast iron. This one on the bottom is a wrought brass. Uh, we can see that in the case of the brass, I have some reduction in the area right at the fracture point that's more, greater than the reduction in the area in, along the rest of the gauge length, whereas the cast iron, the diameter at the fracture point is the same as the diameter away from the fracture point. So this necking down before fracture is associated with ductility, and this uh, lack of necking, fracture that occurs before necking, is associated with a material characteristic that we call uh, being brittle. So I could have a fracture surface between the two extremes of a 100% brittle and 100% ductile. If the sample fractures and uh, like that and there's uh, no reduction in the diameter, then the material is 100% brittle. Over here, leave a space in the middle. Over here, if the sample necks down to a point before it breaks, then that's 100% ductile. And most metals are going to neck down to some extent and then have uh, a little bit of brittle fracture right there at the very end. 
So there is actually a diameter there at, at it, where it breaks, and I would call that moderately ductile or moderate ductility. So we characterize the ductility as follows. First section A is ductility. What do I mean when I describe something as being ductile? What is ductility? Ductility is the permanent strained fracture. Permanent strain to fracture. And there's two measures of ductility. One is the percent elongation, percent elongation, and percent EL is just the length at fracture minus the original length over the original gauge length times 100%. LF is the gauge length at fracture. or after fracture. The other measure of ductility is called the percent reduction in area. Number two is percent reduction in area. Percent RA is the original area minus the final area over the original area times 100%. A sub 0 minus AF divided by A sub 0 times 100%. A0 is the original cross-sectional area. And AF is the cross-sectional area at the point of fracture. A0 is the original cross-sectional area. AF is the cross-sectional area at the point of fracture. Okay, so how might we extract these properties from a test, a tension test? So I'm going to draw a schematic of a tensile test where I plotted stress and strain, stress on the y-axis, strain on the x-axis, and let's say my material has an elastic modulus uh, with a slope that looks like that. And then this curve uh, goes up and then bends over, and then it fractures. Well, the permanent strain at fracture would be found by unloading the sample with the same slope uh, as the original elastic slope. If we could unload it just before it fractured, then I would have a final strain at fracture of epsilon f. In other words, it does bring back that amount of strain when there is uh, the fracture occurs. We recover some elastic strain when it breaks. So we could uh, estimate the strain at fracture, EF. And that's not just the strain at fracture, that is the permanent strain at fracture. And the percent EL then is going to be the epsilon F times 100 percent. So if I had to uh, describe that, if I had to describe uh, whether a material with a stress strain curve like this was ductile or brittle, I would say that is a ductile material.
if the stress strain curve looks like I'm drawing in green, basically parallel, but then broke at a much smaller strain. I would call that a, a brittle material. And the the rule of thumb is going to be that something is brittle if the percent elongation is less than 5%. So that's a, a rule of thumb that if the strain to fracture is total strain to fracture is less than 0.05 or elongation of less than 5%, we say that material is brittle. Now, another thing that is used to describe uh, the material behavior is called toughness. And toughness is the area under the curve. And so the area under the curve is going to be both related to how much the strain is at fracture as well as what is the strength. So in this particular case, the area under the ductile uh, material curve is greater than the area under the curve for the brittle material. So the, duct one, the ductile material in this particular case would be tougher than the brittle material. So in terms of notes, the second section on fracture is called toughness another material property. And toughness is the energy required for fracture. It's the energy required for fracture. It's also estimated as the area under the stress strain curve. the area under the stress-strain curve. So if my stress-strain curve looks like that, then the area under the curve is the toughness, and you would find the area under the curve by taking the integral from zero to the final strain of sigma the epsilon, where the final strain is given at the fracture point. Okay, the, the next section of uh, this part of the class, Roman numeral 4, deals with hardness. And hardness is the resistance to indentation. So, so you know, it's the, res the resistance of the surface to be deformed, um, indented, or scratched. So the way hardness is usually tested is with a indenter. And a force is applied to push the indenter into the surface of the sample. So we have a sample and we have an indentor. And the hardness test is uh, defined by the shape of the indentor and the uh, magnitude of the applied load and uh, what we actually measure. In some of the tests, we measure the depth of penetration T. In some of the other tests, we measure the diameter of the indent D. The standardized tests vary by the indenter geometry. 
standardized tests vary by indentor geometry. There are many different types of hardness tests. Uh, two that we'll discuss are the Brunel hardness test and the Rockwell hardness test. So here is the, uh, how you spell Brunel, B-R-I-N-E-L-L. -L. We'll talk about the Brunel hardness number, E-H-N. Brunel hardness testing uses a hard steel or carbide spherical indenter. You have a hard steel or carbide sphere indentor. And the D is the uh, diameter of the indentor of the sphere. And in the Brunel hardness test, that diameter uh, is going, needs to be converted to millimeters if it's not already that way. We measure the indent diameter. Little d is the diameter of the indent. Also in millimeters. And uh, P is the applied load in kilograms. With those units, we calculate the dimensionless Brunel hardness number as 2P over pi times big D times the quantity big D minus the square root of big D squared minus little d squared. And usually big D is 10 millimeters as the standard test. While this appears to have units of uh, stress, we've got force and two lengths in the bottom, Brunel hardness number is unitless. There are no units associated, they're reported with Brunel hardness number. Now, what people have observed with Brunel hardness testing is that it's proportional the, the Brunel hardness number is proportional to the tensile strength. So the observation is the BHN and the tensile strength are proportional for a lot of materials. BHN and TS are proportional for many materials. So this is a chart from the textbook. I can make it a little bit larger. In this chart we have tensile strength plotted on this line and Brunel hardness plot plotted on that line and many different materials have different strengths and uh, hardness numbers and we get a fairly good correlation between tensile strength and Brunel hardness number. So that means that we can um, do some quality uh, testing by just doing hardness tests on the surface of a sample rather than having to cut out tensile test specimens and measure the, the tensile strength once we know that correlation. Okay. Another example of a uh, hardness test that's frequently used is the Rockwell test. And I like the Rockwell C hardness number. C is the scale. And the equation for calculating the Rockwell C from a test is 100 minus 500 T, where T is the indent depth. Note that the geometry of the indenter in terms of the size of it, like and the, the load are not included in this equation. 
The different scales for Rockwell all have different uh, applied loads and uh, indenter shapes. And so always for RC, the, the load is 150 kilograms. And the in, indenter is a diamond cone. And a diamond cone indentor. Okay. The next section of the notes deals with design considerations. And for aerospace and automotive applications, we usually try to minimize weight. For aerospace and automotive and other, but particularly those types of applications, we need to minimize weight. So instead of just selecting materials based on their elastic modulus or yield strength, we often use something called a specific property, a specific stiffness, for example. Specific stiffness is going to be E, the elastic modulus, over rho, where rho is the density. Or we might select a material based on specific strength. And if we're talking about specific yield strength, then we're just taking the yield strength and dividing it by the density. So this is one type of design consideration where it's not just the mechanical properties that are important, but it's the mechanical properties uh, per unit weight. Another thing to consider in design is the variability of properties. The variability of properties means that properties vary. Now, usually elastic properties are constant for a given composition. of the alloy. So E, uh, Young's modulus, elastic modulus doesn't vary much, uh, but other properties like yield strength, tensile strength, and percent elongation can be changed by processing. YS, TS, percent EL can be changed by processing. So you could heat treat a material or uh, cold work it and change the strength and ductility, but the heat treatment would generally not affect the elastic properties. So almost all steels have the same elastic modulus but have many different uh, yield strengths and tensile strengths depending on the uh, exact condition of the material as a result of processing. As a result of the variability in properties, designers use safety factors. Therefore, designers use safety factors. And an example might be uh, that the safe stress, sigma safe is the safe stress, 
might be the yield strength divided by N, where N is the safety factor. N is the safety factor. So what are some things that uh, N depends on? Well, what do you think the safety factor would depend on? One thing might be exactly how variable are the properties. And the cost of the material may uh, depend on how the, uh, what kind of quality control procedures are being used to produce that material. And uh, so the variability of properties uh, is going to be a function of the cost of the material, or the other way around, actually. Another thing that uh, would affect the safety factor that an engineer would use would be the accuracy of the stress calculations. The accuracy of the stress calculations is going to be something to consider. And a third factor to consider is going to be the consequences of failure. So I'm going to use a larger safety factor if the consequences of failure uh, are very costly in terms of uh, either material property or human life. Typically, your safety factors are going to be, be between 1.2 and 4. So 1.2 less than n less than 4. All right. And so that is where we will stop this section on tensile deformation properties and hardness. Thank you for watching.